Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out in the audience. It's great to have my father with me today. He's had a rough week. Um, had pneumonia, was in the hospital for several days, and, and they let him out Friday. So I'm glad to have him and the rest of my family here with me this morning. In general, Father's Day this year, this year is interesting for me. Uh, my baby girl graduated from high school last week. I'm still working on dealing with that. Uh, so I'm just really trying to enjoy this year, but I know that this is likely the last Father's Day where I have a full-time child in our house. Um, from here on out, at best, it'll probably be part-time between semesters of, of college or as a rent-paying tenant. But, <laughs> but I'm enjoying the time. I've got both of them home here this summer, so I'm enjoying that. I want you to think about the best piece of advice that you've ever received. I ask my children that question. Be careful when you ask your children a question, you're likely to get answers. Here are some of the ones that I got. Make sure that you write these down, you pay attention based on the number of children we have back in kids' life. A lot of you are going to have to go through some of the things that I've already gone through. I asked Jeremy the best piece of advice I've ever given you. He came up with this. If you're going to get a tattoo, make sure that you spend enough money to get a good one and get an artist to draw it. That's actually, that's good advice because, I mean, if I can draw it, you don't want it tattooed on your body. I draw fat stick figures. So that's good advice. Mia Either Mia didn't want to be a part of a sermon illustration, or I've simply never given her any good fatherly advice. She just simply decided not to answer. I told her that was fine, that I was going to use one of my choosing. Last year, I took her to her first concert at uh, PNC Amphitheater. If you've ever been to a concert there, you may uh, realize that when you get there, if you're wearing boots, they will ask you to take your boots off. They want to make sure that you don't have anything smuggled in inside of your boots. Here's the advice, ladies. If you are going to wear an extremely short skirt and consume large amounts of alcohol, don't wear boots. At the very best, at the very best, you may be able to stand up and get your boots off. At the worst, you're going to fall on your behind and Victoria's Secret ain't going to be a secret no more. The expression on Mia's face alone was priceless. She said, Dad, did you see that? And I said, absolutely not. I made sure I was looking the other direction. But the advice is good for young ladies. As a dad of a father, or a dad of a father, as a dad of a daughter, cover up what needs to be covered up. There is something attractive about modesty and godliness. So dress appropriately, ladies. Dads, teach your daughters to dress appropriately. Mason, my oldest son, he's 30, perhaps because he's the oldest, perhaps because he's a pastor uh, in Japan and he realizes the value of serious uh, sermon illustrations. He actually had one serious piece of advice that I had given him and, and it was really cool because he said, a number of years ago, you set me down and... To understand, Mason and I have a similar story as teenagers and, and young adults and 20-somethings as far as the things that we did and, and, and that kind of thing. And Mason said, I told him to remember, I always want you to come to me and know that you can discuss anything, that I will give you my advice that there's likely nothing that you're ever going to tell me that I haven't done or heard before, and that I would much rather you learn from my mistakes than to have to learn the hard way like I did and go through it myself. So there's some good advice in that, dads, moms. You need to be willing, you need to be vulnerable enough with your children so that they know they can come to you and discuss anything. You have to be willing to have uncomfortable conversations so that your children can learn from you. That's important. Good advice. 
So often, I feel like good advice is just ignored or overlooked. You've probably done this before if you have children, or you remember as you were a child, you give your child a piece of advice, do this, don't do that. How do they respond? Why? How do you respond to the why? Because I said so. Sometimes that's actually a good enough reason. Clean, clean your room. Why? Because I said so. It really doesn't matter the purpose behind a clean house or clean room or anything else. I just need you to know, I want you to clean your room, go do it. So sometimes the why doesn't matter. Other times, you just don't have enough time to explain the why. Several years ago, as Jeremy was learning to drive, we live at a very busy intersection. 218 Millgrove Road, they're putting a roundabout in now because people have been killed. There have been accidents on a monthly, if not weekly, basis at that intersection. It's dangerous. Fortunately, this night, there was absolutely no traffic whatsoever. We needed to go to Mint Hill, which is to the right. We pulled up to the stop sign. Jeremy turned left. I said, where are you going? Jeremy goes, oh, and he proceeds to make a 360-degree circle in the middle of the intersection. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I need to go the other way. Why are you yelling at me? Because I'm afraid you're going to get us killed. I thought at some point he would pause and look and make sure that there was no traffic coming. He's just like, no, nah, I knew there wasn't anything coming, so I just did it. Sometimes there aren't enough time, isn't enough time to explain why. You just give an instruction, you need to be, have it followed. But there's times I realized that especially when it's something that's really significant, something that I really want my children or someone else to get, that if they understand the why behind the advice, they are much more likely to pay attention if they understand the why. If ever there was anyone that should be able to get away with just saying, because I told you so, it would be God. Why God? Because I said so. That would be enough. But what I find as I read through the Bible is time and time and time again, when, when God gives an instruction, He explains the why. He wants us to understand. Think back to the book of Joshua. Keep my law, meditate on it night and day. Why? So you will be prosperous and have good success. Anybody want to be prosperous and have good success? I know that I do. Jesus, in the New Testament, I came. Why? That they might have life and have it abundantly. Anybody want to have a full and abundant life? I do. And what I find is if I do God's things, God's way, in God's time, it goes well with me. I understand that. So I want you this morning to understand the why. I don't have enough time to, to go into this, but I want to recommend a resource. If you've ever heard of TED Talks, TED is not a person. TED is an institute. They have one by Simon Sedek. It's called The Golden Circle, and it talks all about why it's so important for people to understand the why. Facts and figures don't drive behavior. Belief in the mission, belief in the vision, belief in why and the purpose, that's what drives us to change. That's what drives us to do things, understanding why. This morning, I want you to walk away understanding why this fatherly advice is so important. I'm going to be in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and chapter 5 specifically. Chapter 4, as you'll notice in a few minutes, begins with the word therefore. And as I was taught, when I run into the word therefore, I back up to see what in the world the word is therefore. When I do that, I find that Paul has just spent the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians explaining to the believers in Ephesus what God had done for them and who they were in Christ. So as a result of these first three chapters, as a result of what God has done in a believer's life, as a result of what God has done for you, this is how you should respond to the instructions. 
The immediate context is unity, unity in the church specifically. One of the key themes is, is glory in the church. And I found that a united church is much more glorious than a church that's marked by division and disunity. But I believe Paul's instructions are great for all of us. They're just good life instructions and for believers in particular to understand. If I knew that I only had a little bit of time and just some last words to leave with my children... These instructions, these four instructions would be some good ones. They would sum it up pretty well. But don't miss what Paul does throughout chapter 4, chapter 5. He explains the why. Every time he gives an instruction, he explains the why before the how. The first word of advice then, walk in confidence. Chapter 4, verse 1 I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Note that whenever Paul uses this word walk, he does it a lot in his letters. He uses it to speak to the manner of living, your manner of life, doing things in a certain manner. It could be phrased this way, live your life in a manner worthy of the calling. Why? Because of what was written in chapters 1 through 3. Because of who God is, because of what He has done, live your life in a manner worthy of your calling. Then I come to calling. What's your calling? When you think about that, who are you? You may say, I'm a father, I'm a son, a husband, wife, brother, sister, CEO, business owner, employee. What's your true and real identity? Who are you? If you woke up tomorrow morning and you were no longer that thing, if you lost your job, if your company folded, if you were no longer a father, a husband, what would you do? My role as a father is changing. I will still be a father. But if my sole identity was only as the father of my children, if that's the only thing that drove me, then in August I would be in trouble. When I was no longer a full-time in-the-house father, I've got some adjusting to do. What's your calling? In the Greek language, the calling in this instance was used to, uh, as an invitation the Greeks would have understood it as an invitation. Often it was an invitation to a banquet. The New Testament, the only place this word, this calling is used, it refers to an invitation to the kingdom of God and the privileges that come with that. I've been called. If you're in Christ, you've been called. Where have you been called? Where have you been invited? You've been invited to a heavenly banquet. That should change you. That should change me. In light of that, how do I respond? When I know that, I can walk in confidence of who I am, but worthy. How can I be worthy of that? I get to that word and I think I'm not worthy. Again, remembering in Christ first, but second, in this particular context, worthy means in a right or appropriate manner. You could put the sentence together like this. Live your life in a manner that's in line with your invitation to the kingdom of God. Live your life in that manner. Have you ever struggled with confidence? Most of us have at some time or another. I know that I have. I want my children to be confident. I've done my best to raise them in, in a manner so that they can be confident in their abilities. One, yes, but I want them to be confident in who they are. Because confidence first, I believe, comes from knowing who you are. If you understand your identity, that comes with confidence. Fake it until you make it is only going to take you so far. One of the absolute worst jobs I ever had in my post-college dropout, got to do something to make money job, was a copier salesman. I don't know how those guys do it. They come to the office all the time. And I know, I think, 
Never again, never again, never again. I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't want to learn anymore. I didn't like the job. I wasn't a salesman. You know how many copies I, copiers I sold? Zero. If you're out there and you're a salesman, you know if you have no confidence in your abilities, you have no confidence in your product, you're not going to have any sales. No matter how long I faked it, I was never going to make it as a copier salesman. Hear this this morning. You'll never be able to fake your way into the kingdom of God. All of these instructions, chapter 4, 5, and 6, all of these instructions are a result of who you already are in Christ. You can't just, if you, if you have never committed your life to Christ, you can't simply do these things and all of a sudden wind up in the kingdom of heaven. It's not going to happen. You can't fake it till you make it. Have you trusted Christ for your eternity? If you have, Philippians 1.6 says that you can be confident that he who began the work in you will bring it to completion. You can be confident. Who are you in Christ? Briefly, Chapter 1, verse 3, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 7, you are redeemed and forgiven in Christ. Verse 11, you've already obtained an inheritance. You can't work to obtain that inheritance. There's nothing that you can do good enough to earn it. You have an inheritance already in Christ. Verse 18, you have hope. Chapter 2, verse 4, you are loved. You can be confident. God loves you and desires the best for you and knows how things work together. Chapter 3, verse 12, you have boldness and access with confidence to the God of the universe who created and designed you. Know who you are. Most of us probably don't remember taking our first steps as a, as a toddler. But we've likely, in recent memory, watched other toddlers learn how to walk. It's kind of comical. They'll try to pull themselves up on something, try to stand up, wobble, fall down on their butt, bounce back up, take another step, fall down. Over and over and over again, it looks extremely painful and awkward. There's nothing confident about it. But what do you find as children begin to take steps on their own? Their confidence grows. As they learn, as they continue to learn how to walk, their confidence grows and their walk improves. Practice, practice, practice. In order to begin and, and walking in Christ, you have to know what that means. You have to follow the instructions, and as you do, your confidence will grow. Not in your own abilities, but in the confidence in what Christ has done in you and through you. Know who you are. Know why it's important. Learn what it means to live your life in line with that calling. God didn't save you and just leave you out there on your own to figure it out. Through His Word and through the power of the Holy Spirit, God will enable you to live that life. He doesn't want you to be ignorant. Walk in confidence. Second word of advice, walk in love. Verse 2 goes on to give some more details about what walking uh, in a worthy or appropriate manner looks like. It says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I switched, used the New Living Translation because I love that phrase. Make allowances for each other's fault. Your translation may say bearing with one another in love. But I like this explanation. Make allowance for each other's faults. If you know and believe in what God has done in you, what God has done for you, you have no choice but to walk in love. It's not optional. Be humble. Why? Because of your love. Be gentle. Why? Because of your love. Make allowances. Why? Because of your love. Be patient. Why? Because of your love. Will you always be successful? No. I'm not. Does it give you an excuse to stop trying? No, it doesn't. If you look at the world around us today, 
you see people just flocking to blame other people for everything. You see people being extremely critical of one another. You watch the news, it can be, disp- it can be quite depressing. I've had enough of it. I've had enough of people tearing one another down. I've watched it start, instead of the church seeping into the world around us, the other thing has happened. The world has seeped into the church, and so I see more and more brothers and sisters in Christ attacking and tearing one another down as opposed to building one another up. It's got to stop. It's not what I want to teach my children. It's not what I want to live my life like myself. I want to walk in love. I want to make allowances for each other's faults. How do we do that? It's not popular. It's not easy. Admit when we're wrong. If we start taking responsibility for our own actions, it's not popular. But maybe, just maybe, if we quit tearing each other down and started building one another up, Others would follow the example and do the same thing. See and expect the best from others. My wife is great at this. And when I get too critical, she's careful to point me back in the other direction because she always sees the best in in, in other people and other circumstances. Don't tear down, build up. Drop down verses 11 and 12. It says, He gave the apostles, the prophets the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry or service. Why? For building up the body of Christ. We make allowances for one one another's faults. We walk in love when we serve one another. At New Life, we use the words love, grow, show. You see them written over the doors as you walk out when you leave. We talk about core values. We talk about love always being first on the list at the center of everything that we do as a church and as believers has to be grounded in a genuine love for God and love for people or else there is no eternal impact. I've talked about this in discovery class if you've been. If you ser- there are a lot of good service organizations in the world. There are a lot of organizations that do good things, but they have no eternal impact. Why? Because there is no love, for, it's not grounded in a love for God and a love for people. That's how we're going to have an internal impact. Jesus himself, he came to serve others, not be served. The outworking of love is service. We speak the truth with one another. Don't miss the last part. In love. Why? Because that's how we're going to grow as we have difficult conversations with one another, with fellow believers, in love and in truth, building one another up until we are united and complete in the head of the church, which is Christ. We have to be able to have truthful conversations because truth without love is brutal, ineffective, legalistic. That's one extreme tears people down. Love without truth is nothing more than sentimentalism. We need to find our way into the middle. Neither one of those produces effective growth. Full disclosure and transparency, it's difficult for me to do that. I often have to go back and apologize. My son and I have had a couple conversations in the past week where what I've said has been extremely truthful but not necessarily very loving. We have to find out how to communicate with one another better. Because if I just give him the truth and say, do that in an unloving manner, all I do is tick him off, and he's not likely to follow my advice. What's the point? But we have to speak the truth to one another in love. Growth doesn't happen overnight. Maturity doesn't happen overnight. It's a long and painful process. But we can't avoid walking together with one another in love. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You are never more like Jesus than when you're loving, forgiving, and serving other people. Imitate God. 
Chapter 5, verse 1 kind of closes out the section. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Have you ever noticed that children imitate their parents? When I look at my children and some of their characteristics, I have absolutely no doubt of who their parents are. It's obvious. But have you ever heard this expression, I get it honest? It's often used by someone who wants to say that they have inherited a characteristic, inherited uh, a trait from one of their, you know, from either their mother or their father, and there's nothing that they can do about it. My mom was like this, and so I'm like this. There's nothing I can do about it. My dad did this, so I'm going to do this. There's nothing that I can do about it. Hogwash. <laughs> Just so you know, your decisions, your actions, your responsibilities are your own. Own them. But children imitate their parents. If someone were to follow you around for a while and they saw you, who would they say your father is? Who's your daddy? The father of lies or the father of love? One another. What does your life reflect on the whole? Who are you imitating? Walk in confidence. Walk in love. Third word of advice. Walk in light. Chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Not you have light, you are light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Light exposes darkness. Why do you walk in light? Because light produces light just the same way as apple trees produce apples, not bananas. If you are light, you will produce light. Walking in love dealt primarily with relationships between fellow believers, walking in light starts looking at the relationships between us and those who do not know God, looking at us and the world, believers in the world. Some of us have been committed followers of Christ since you were a young child, you grew up in church, committed your life to Christ at an early age, and you have lived out that calling for your entire life. Others like me didn't commit their life to Christ until 10, 12 years ago, and it's much easier to remember what it was like when I was walking in darkness. But in either case, think with me about these real-world situations that happen on a daily basis. These day, access to pornography is much more widespread, so it's not likely that somebody is going to come up and bring uh, an adult printed magazine uh, along with you on a road trip, you know, or something like that, it's far more likely that they'll have a phone or a tablet or a computer. It's just the access is so much greater. So what happens when either you see a coworker, have someone text them, send them a sexually explicit video or, or image, or if you receive that to yourself, how do you respond? Pass it around to your buddies. Stay silent. Ask for more. Send back a video of your own. What about inappropriate jokes and comments about other coworkers at work? How do you respond? Do you rebuke them and think, boy, if I tell them off that I'm going to completely damage this relationship and I'll have no more opportunity, do you remain silent? Do you participate? It happens every day and worse. It's a morally dark world. How do you respond? How is a Christian to respond? In your effort to relate to the world, do you go along and ignore biblical truth 
because you don't want to offend someone. That's one extreme. The other extreme is completely draw, withdrawing from friends, relatives, places where inappropriate things are taking place so that you have absolutely no influence whatsoever. Neither one is going to have a positive effect for the kingdom. We've got to figure out as Christians how we walk in a morally dark world and share the light as opposed to withdrawing from it or simply uh, telling our friends off or going along with it. We have to find the middle ground. How? We will be good. That's what it says. For the fruit of light is goodness. It's a noun form of a verb that means active goodness or benevolent. A good person cares about other people. You can care and do good things for other people regardless of how they behave, what they believe, or how much you agree with what they're doing. You can still do good things for them. You should do good things for them. Those are the most difficult people to do good things for. But that's shedding light. James Jacob in India is one of the best examples I've ever seen because on a daily basis, he sees pastors and believers beaten, killed, abused, persecuted at any time James could simply say, I've had enough. I'm no longer going to preach Jesus, and things will go better for him, but he doesn't. He continues to do good things in the communities. And guess what? He has influence. Even in the most radical Hindu communities, James has influence with politicians and police officials. Why? Because they see the good things that James does. They don't believe in what he believes in. They don't agree with him on religious grounds, but they see his good works. They see the good things he does for the community. They see his goodness. And time and time again, James will tell us, you see that police officer over there? He used to be a Hindu. You see that person over there? He used to be a Hindu. He wanted to know what was different, and as he heard the gospel and responded, the goodness gave James the door to share the gospel. We can be good. We can be right or righteous, just and conform to God's standards regardless of how others around us behave. We'll be true. Given the opportunity, I will speak the truth in love, no matter how uncomfortable that may be, because truth must be spoken Truth and light are attractive. We'll learn what's pleasing to the Lord. How? Prioritize disciplines such as prayer, Bible study, spending time together with fellow believers. Then when we go out in the world, we can have an impact for the world as opposed to the other way around. It's increasingly morally dark with shootings, all kinds of uh, sexual uh, crimes, uh, sexual immorality, shootings, all kinds of things. It's an increasingly morally dark world. The world needs our light. They need to see us. That's good advice. Walk in confidence, walk in love, walk in light. The final word of advice, walk in wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? Me and I went and saw Eric Church in Greensboro uh, back in March. If you happen to be an Eric Church fan, you may know that he's got a song out on this latest album called Some of It. The song is nothing more than a bunch of practical uh, wisdom, one-liners about advice. Some of those include, Mama ain't a shrink, especially not in our house. Mama says suck it up. Daddy ain't a bank. I, sometimes I feel that way. <laughs> sometimes daddy feels like a bank. God ain't a wishing well. Too often we just, we just take our, our, our wishes and our wants to God when he really wants us. Money ain't rich. 
There are things in those, in this life far more important than money. You can be money. You can have money and be extremely poor. Everybody sins. Truth. Nobody wins in a fight. The chorus then tells the story of where the where this wisdom comes from, uh, from a worldly perspective. Any anyway, some of it you read on a page. Some of it comes with heartbreak. Most of it comes with age. None of it ever comes easy. A bunch of it maybe you can't use, but there's something to some of it. That's the truth. I've read some really good books, taken a lot of wisdom from books, but I can assure you that, that going to school at Fruitland Baptist Bible Institute I learned a lot about ministry there. I've learned far more here. Some of the things you just can't get from a book. You've got to have practical experience. I've learned a lot from age. Some things just aren't worth getting upset over. Some things aren't worth fighting over. Walk in love. I know a lot of useless facts. This frustrates Anita because she can't ever tell if I know a useless fact or if I'm just making something up. So she'll ask, you know, she'll ask me a question, I'll just spit out an answer. She'll go, really? Yeah, absolutely, honest. Uh-uh, you're making that up. And she kind of has to go along, because as soon as she says, you're lying to me, I'll go, no, I'm not, and I'll prove it. Because I just know some useless things. Frustrates her to no end. Jeremy coming in this morning, uh, responded to somebody, and I've already f forgotten what he said, but it wasn't true. I mean, he just kind of made it up on the fly. I'm like, yep, I can tell. Jeremy is my child. <laughs> he gets it honest. He could do something about it. He chooses not to. A bunch of it. I could too, not just Jeremy. A bunch of what I know you can't use, but my prayer for you is that you will walk away from here understanding why. Because I'm telling you, it's heartbreaking to, to share biblical truth and have people walk away and not understand and not be changed by it. It is. It's, it's one of the most difficult things as a pastor is to see people walk away unchanged. So I'm hoping that if you understand the why, because of what God's done for you and in you, that it will drive your response. Godly wisdom. Chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of time. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. That's that word again. People see sub submit being submissive to someone, and they don't like that word. That's an entirely another message but submit to one another, why? Out of reverence for Christ, not for reverence for the other person. Out of reverence for Christ. How do you obtain and walk in godly wisdom? Make the best use of your time. Get your priorities in order. Here is some hard biblical truth with love. Some of you need to get your priorities in order. Because I can't tell you the number of times I hear, man, I ain't seen you at church in two months. I've been busy. I've got news. We are all busy people. I'm busy. My wife's busy. My children's busy. The staff is busy. Everyone in here is busy. But you are going to do things in the order that you prioritize them. God, family, church, everything else. Is that difficult to do? Yes. Do I always accomplish that? No. But I understand 
the why it's important to be here and to be plugged in and to serve and be surrounded by my Christian brothers and sisters listening to godly teaching and wisdom as many weeks out of the year as I can be. You won't see me lay at home in bed or go fishing or play golf for two months on end. In, in, in love, understanding, I love you, but I have to teach what Scripture says. Understand what the will of the Lord is. How do you do that? Verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. He's going to guide you. He's going to enable you. Here's a novel concept. If you need wisdom, go to the Lord and ask. James chapter 1, verse 5, If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. It will be given to him. Without reproach, God wants you to ask. As a father, I love it when my children come to me and ask for advice before they do things, as opposed to afterwards saying, Dad, I really screwed this up. What do I need to do? I much prefer, come to me for advice. God wants you to go to Him for advice. God wants you to have wisdom. He has a great source of wisdom in His Word and fellow believers. Go to the Lord for wisdom. Ask. God's not going to, he doesn't want you to be ignorant, just like I don't want my children to be. You may have heard and you may have this belief that it's difficult to just read and understand Scripture for yourself. Go through, take this book, take, take the book of Ephesians, read it, see how simple it is. Three chapters, this is who you are. Three chapters, this should be your response. What, how, why. You can read it and understand it for yourself. Don't make it more difficult than it is. Generally, I find the problem comes out of obedience, a lack of obedience, and not a lack of knowledge. Several months ago, we went and saw a movie that's coming out in August. It's called Overcomer. Really good movie by the Kendrick brothers, the guys that did uh, Fireproof and Courageous, all those other movies. This one is really centered in identity. I think it's an extremely important message for today's society. They use the book of Ephesians in that, so that's just a plug for I've been thinking about this message for two months since I saw the preview. But I want to share, as we close, just something from me as graduation speaker. His name was Cam Spear. He played linebacker for Piedmont High School. He graduated. He went on to App State where he played linebacker. He was on a couple of their championship teams. I believe he was the team captain when App State beat Michigan, not Michigan State, as I said in the first service, when App State beat Michigan back in 2007. And among other things, he's had various jobs in life, but he went on a mission trip several years ago, and he said, the mission trip changed my life. He went to India, and he saw all the, the children involved in sex traffic and, and, and sex slavery business in, in India. And he said, I got so mad about it. I saw what was happening, and I just got so mad. And I kept on, I asked God again and again and again, God, what are you going to do about it? God, what are you going to do about it? God, what are you going to do about it? And he said, this is the answer I received from God. God said, Cam, what are you going to do about it? Years later, Cam is now with the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations, and he investigates uh, sex trafficking and sex slavery, which unfortunately is very big in the Charlotte area. He shared all that to say that what he does now, what he's passionate about, has grown out of what he saw then. When you're passionate about something, and he, taught, he wanted the students to learn, find out what you're passionate about. Pursue what you're passionate about. Because with passion comes confidence. What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about Jesus? Are you passionate about walking in wisdom? Are you passionate about walking in light? When you have passion... You can't keep that in. 
It will change you. I want you to walk out of here passionate about why it's so important, why it's so necessary, why your response should be to follow this advice. He closed with this passage of Scripture. Yes, high school graduation, he closed with this passage of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, My son, good advice from a father, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Why? For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Why? So you will find favor and good success in sight of God and man. Blending in with the world is not the secret to good success. Looking like everyone else is not the secret to success. Good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will make straight your paths. Be wise not in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. Why? It will be healing to your flesh, refreshment to your bones. As we close, happy Father's Day to, uh, again, to all the fathers. But I want to pray for a couple groups of people. Again, if you are not in Christ, that's step one. You can't fake it till you make it. I want to pray for that group first and then for the, for the rest of us. God, we love you. We're so thankful to be able to come and worship uh, you to be able to uh, open up your word and to see the truth that it contains. So God, I just pray first for those who have not yet committed their lives to you. God, that they will. That in faith, they will commit their lives to you and follow you. God, for the rest of us, I just pray for uh, godly fathers, for them to have the confidence to uh, walk in love and truth and light and wisdom with their families. God, I pray that you will just raise up godly fathers, godly families, so that we can make an influence on the world as opposed to the world having an influence on us. God, for people in here that perhaps they have not been walking in love, there's a relationship that needs restoration. God, that there's forgiveness that needs to be given. God, I just pray for those relationships. God, I just pray for continued courage to be different in a world that so much needs to see our light. I just pray that in this community, in our workplaces, through our students, through our parents, wherever we go, that we are light to a dark world, that we'll continue to see people that are far from you experience new life in Christ, and you'll be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope that everyone has a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.